Great. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Roger Schwell. In addition to being quadruple board certified in internal medicine, sleep medicine, pulmonary medicine, and critical care. He is a YouTube sensation. He has a channel called MedCram. I'll link to it below. You have to check it out. Almost a million and a half followers. Anything you need to know medically, you pretty much can find on that channel. So I'm very honored to have him on the show today. He actually was my doctor when I lived in the desert and I miss him terribly because he's a he's a wonderful doctor and he eats plants and we're going to find out when he started and why. Please welcome him to the show. It's very nice to see you again, Dr. Schwell. Thank you for taking the time. I know you're a very busy, actual working doctor. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to see you again too. Well, thank you. I mean, you're, I mean, like if I, I mean, how do you even have time to be a doctor and have a, a thriving YouTube channel? I mean, a million and a half followers is no small feat. Let me tell you. Well, I, I never really was a good organizer, but I've become that way. But I'll tell you, I learned a lot from my wife, who is, uh, who's a great organizer and has a lot of great thoughts. And if it wasn't for her, I don't think we could get the household going where it needs to be going while I'm doing all this. So um, it, ta- it takes a village, like they, all, like they always say, uh, but definitely a team. How did you, how, tell me a little bit about your channel. Like what, what is it about? How did it start and how did you build it to such an incredible uh, number? Well, what we did was uh, I was a, um, a, a physician in a clinic, and I would also see uh, students that would rotate through on their rotations. And uh, Loma Linda's PA program, physician assistant program, rotated their students through. And in 2012, Kyle Allred, who was a PA student at the time, was one of my students. Now, he has a background because his father was interested in medical education, and he saw that um, that uh, perhaps I would be good on YouTube. Um, the The plan was at the time was, uh, if you recall, there's a, a Khan Academy, which is um, basically a YouTube channel where they draw things and they explain things, but not necessarily in the medical field. There was a, a medical aspect to it, but he thought that we could do a great job. I really latched on to it because every month it was a new PA student and we were doing the same lectures. I said, hey, let's, let's flip the classroom, put the lecture on YouTube, have them watch it. And then um, the next day we could go over it and it would be a much better use of my time. Also, they could slow it down and stop it and look back. Anyway, we started the YouTube channel back in 2012 and it, it grew. Uh, it was successful. And then... Um, probably right before COVID, we were up to about 400,000 subscribers. So pretty successful. And then COVID hit. And my wife, um, sometime in January of 2020 said, Hey, maybe you should do a COVID video. And I did. And it just blew up. And um, we've never looked back since that time. So we talk, we, we actually, our audience on the channel is for healthcare providers, but it's also for people who want to know more about their health. And we've actually uh, picked up a lot of people. In fact, most of our audience now are, are non-healthcare providers. Wow. Well, your wife sounds like a smart cookie. So will she be my YouTube advisor? <laughs> um, sure, sure. She can do that. <laughs> I mean, that, that, I just, well, congratulations. And you're such a kind yeah. and humble person. And you did you ever have any uh, practice like in public speaking? Because, you know, you're, you're very articulate and, and you come across very well. Did you have to practice this or was this I, just- I like, was, I took a speech class in high school. I was okay. Um, my dad made me memorize poems on the weekend when we would act up and, you know, try- <laughs> But I think I think where a lot of the training came from, obviously the talents that God gave me. But um, as a when you're in the medical profession, there's a lot of opportunity to teach. And so in my medical education, I became a chief resident, and it was my job to put together uh, lectures for students on on a daily basis. So I had to be able to uh, look at a topic, think about what was the best way of of putting together, explain it as best as I could, and then make a PowerPoint presentation. And so doing that for a number of years, I think primed me for this. Wow. Do you, are your videos highly edited or are you pretty good, like one take and they go up? Um, They, they do get some editing. Uh, There are a couple of takes. It's not highly edited. Well, the the flow that we do is I I record it um, and then we send it to our editor. It usually takes them about a day and a half. It's Daphne and, and she's just amazing. Um, and, and she usually gets it uploaded within a day and a half. So we can get things out pretty quick. How many videos are you doing a week? Well, that varies. Sometimes, um, on average, I would say maybe one or two, but it, it varies because sometimes I have to do ICU for a week and then other times I'm in clinic or other times I'm off. So I can do more on my off week and less on my ICU week. Yeah. Are there any topics that you uh, haven't covered yet that you're looking oh. for? 
covering There's on your channel? So many topics that we haven't covered. People ask, how come you haven't done one on this? Um, so uh, I would love to do videos more on, on, on diet, nutrition, uh, but also exercise, fasting. I think all of these, uh, and we can talk about some of these things, um, they're really important. My expertise though is in pulmonary and critical care. And so um, I've got to realize that even though I'm interested in something, I might not be the, the expert that I want to be. So I try to stay within my lane, but I, I'm also well, well read. I want to make sure I learn as much as I can. Well, let, you know, I, I think of you as a plant-based doctor because I believe you follow an exclusively plant diet. Tell, tell us about that trajectory. Like, cause you, I, 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 I guess I, I don't know as much about Adventism as I should, but I just assumed that all of people that were Seventh-day Adventists were vegan or vegetarian or raised that way. Yeah. And, and that that's for the most part, but um, the, the Seventh-day Adventist view, which is a Christian view, and uh, as a Protestant Christian group is uh, we look at both the old and the new Testament. And so because of that, there's kind of like a, there's like two levels of rules, if you will, there's like the absolute rules that you should really follow. And then, Hey, you should do this if you want to be optimized. And what's the, the absolute rule really follows in parallel with what uh, the old Testament rules were for diet and nutrition, which basically is, is that there's clean and unclean meats. So clean meats would be like anything that had a split hoof and chewed the cud, basically like a cow or a sheep. These were the, the types of animals, as you know, that the Jews would have. And, and it's, it's actually a lot more than that too. So it's not just a matter of picking the right animals to eat. They have to be slaughtered in the right way so that there's not blood that is left in it. A lot of times today, uh, people may think that they're eating kosher. Uh, they maybe think that they're eating clean meats, but if the animal was killed in a way that the blood stayed in the meat, um, that can, that's actually not go according to the kosher. So um, that's, that's sort of the, the absolute rule there that you really should follow. But um, the, the Adventist belief is that the, the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that eating meat was kind of like an emergency measure. Um, and so really, if you want to go to the optimal way of eating, the way that the body was designed, um, then you go back to the way it was at the very beginning, which was fruits and seeds and, and all of these things that are, that, that were given. It's kind of like, you know, it's, it's funny, uh, yesterday, my daughter was pulling out of the driveway and, uh, the, the coolant light came on a coolant light. It's like, wow. Um, so I popped the hood open. I looked in there and, uh, the coolant was sure enough, it was low. And so the question was, should I, should I just have her drive a different car? Or should I just put water? And I looked it up and they said, you know, you can put water into the coolant system as a short-term fix. It's not a long-term fix. If you need to get somewhere, it's the way to go. But the ideal way is to put coolant into the radiator. And that's exactly the same way that we would see, um, you know, in terms of diet nutrition, sort of if there's nothing else, like you know, if you actually, if you read the Bible and look and, and see what happened after the flood, there was no trees, there was no fruits. I think there was an olive leaf if you read it. And so the emergency measure at that time was, you know, eat meat uh, to, to stay alive. But, but the ideal would be not to just put water into the radiator, but to put the actual coolant that was designed for the radiator into the radiator for optimal long-term operation of the vehicle. And in this case, that would be a plant-based diet. And when did you discover one or, or adopt one? Yeah, so I was uh, I was always raised Adventist, uh, but we would eat uh, we would eat meat, and I, I think my my parents growing up um, were early believers and didn't really understand all of the the impact of that. They are fully vegan now, uh, but we were all sort of learning as we went along, and so it was probably around in college. I, I distinctly remember going to the University of California Riverside, where I met my wife. And uh, I would have Carl's Jr. burgers every day, uh, you know, and that, that was that was it. Not really realizing what it was that um, that I might have been doing. And, and we can talk about sialic acids and inflammation from, um, you know, sialic acids in red meats and things of that nature. We talked about that before. When I matriculated to Loma Linda University Medical School, I think that's when I surrounded myself with people who had a slightly different take on, on the, the dietary rules and the benefits. So, so when I was there at Loma Linda, there were people like Gary Frazier who were involved with uh, Adventist Health Study too. There were people, uh, sub, Dr. Sabate, who was involved with a, a lot of this stuff. There was, uh, you know, some of these people too, uh, Chef. 
uh, um, Dr. Ha Hans, Hans Deal. Um, and, and a lot of these people, and I, I, it, it's funny, you know, because you're sort of a product of your environment. And I started to become more conscious and my family too, of the effects of, of eating red meat. And so, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't something that I arrived at where we just like, okay, <laughs> excuse the term cold Turkey. Uh, and we just shut it off. Um, it was one of these things where we just said, you know what? we've been doing this type of practice and we're going to eliminate this practice. And it was kind of a slow transition. And, and I would have to say that I'm still, I'm still in a transition. So do I, do I have cheese occasionally? Yeah. I mean, if I'm out and we're eating pizza, I might have some cheese um, even, you know, maybe once or twice or three times a year, I might have some fish. Now there's problems with fish in terms of mercury. And I understand that that's not something innate in the fish. That's something that you can't really escape. And so this is something that I'm slowly moving over in time. Here's the one thing that I noticed that I think would be very helpful for people who are considering this is I remember distinctly the taste of steak and meat and I loved it. It was good. And um, when I made a decision to stop eating beef, it was about two or three months later. And I'm like, wow, I haven't had beef in a long time. And it was because, you know, I don't make food in my family. My family does. So, um, you know, I guess I could go out and buy a burger, but I never really did. I just made that decision. I, I remember I said, let me just have a burger one more time and see what it's like. And I did. And it tasted completely different than what I was expecting it to taste like. And later I found out that your taste buds actually change. It takes about three or four months to recycle through, but the wiring to your taste buds change so that things that you start to eat, you start to actually get a taste for. And when you remove those things and you think you're going to get that same uh, satisfaction that you got before, it's not there. And it's actually a good thing because it's like, man, I can never go back to eating meat because I'm not going to get the same satisfaction. Actually, the food that I was eating without the meat tasted better to me and was more satisfying than the meat itself. And then the other thing that was interesting was that it actually made me feel ill. I would eat the food, I would eat the beef, and it would like sit and sit in my stomach um, for a long period of time. So I have never gotten back, I have never gone back and eaten uh, a beef uh, again after that. Uh, chicken uh, was, was the next thing. Uh, years later that I cut out realizing, you know, the ill effects of, of chicken. And there's actually been some recent studies that have come out using the biobank in the UK, really big, big studies. And uh, they designed these studies to look to see whether or not it was processed meat versus non-processed red meat that was causing the problem with, uh, with uh, cardiovascular disease. And, you know, there's these people that thought, no, it's just the processed meat that does it. And, and then other people saying, no, it's, it's, it's all of the meat. Well, it turns out that this biobank study showed data that was more consistent with it. Didn't matter if it was processed or unprocessed. It didn't matter at all. It was all, all meat, basically all red meat. But they also looked at chicken. And what was really interesting is they found that chicken was associated with gastroesophageal reflux disease. It was also associated with cardiovascular disease, um, which was really interesting too. And so uh, that sort of just validated in my mind that chicken uh, needed to go. So that's out too. Um, and so I'm, I'm working on the little remnants around the edge here of dairy and, and fish, but uh, give me, give me uh, another year or two and we'll see where I am. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. So, so you, I would imagine your family eats like you or are they too old to now? Okay. So my mom and dad, they're, they are further down that road than I am. So they are, are vegan. They eliminated cheese. They are fasting every week. I'm really proud of my parents. My parents are 80 years of age. And they are very active in the community. They are, um, they go on walks. Um, my father, who used to be a dentist, is retired, but now he's volunteering full time uh, at the university. And uh, and my mom is a retired nurse, and uh, she's she's helping out as well. And they live on their own. They live in a house. They don't, you know, they don't have anyone to take care of them. They're just, it's amazing. So I, I'm really proud of of what they've done. And uh, I only wish they would have gotten onto this earlier, but uh, better late than never. So your dad's an Adventist dentist. 
Yes, he said Adventist dentist. That's right. <laughs> you know, so we don't say cold turkey on Chef AJ Live. We say cold tofurkey. Okay, yes. Yeah. And that's exactly what we had uh, at Thanksgiving this year, tofurkey. Nice. Do, do, because, you you know, you're a real doctor in real practice. Does the opportunity to talk about a plant-based diet to your patients, obviously not if they're like sitting there on a ventilator, but does it ever yeah. come up in private practice? All the time. So uh, as a pulmonary and critical care specialist, I not only work in the intensive care unit, but I also work in the clinic, seeing patients with asthma and COPD and people who smoke. And um, and a lot of these people who have breathing issues also have cardiovascular issues. And absolutely, we discuss uh, cutting back on a meat-based diet. I, I can't tell you how many times I have pulled up on the computer um, David Esselstein, or no, Caldwell Esselstein's book on prevent and reverse heart disease. And I've showed them this. I said, look, this is a very inexpensive uh, book. You know, I don't agree. I might not agree with everything he said in this book. Like I, for instance, I, I believe that maybe nuts are not a bad idea, but hey, I can't argue with his results. His results are phenomenal. I mean, he, he, you can see the angiograms before they went on his diet and after they went on his diet. These are people, by the way, folks, Caldwell Esselstein is a, it was a surgeon that did bypass surgery on his patients. You probably talked about him a lot on this program. And uh, these were people that were so sick, they couldn't even undergo surgery. He put them on a, a plant-based low oil, low fat diet. And, uh, and the angiograms, which basically show the, the condition of the coronary arteries were just fascinating. It, it looked like they were brand new. And this is this is real change. This is not like a, a bypass surgery, which only lasts about five years. This is like your own native blood vessels turning back. So I would I would I would show them this. I would show them the book. I say, hey, I'm not I'm not getting any kickbacks at all. But go and get this book. And here's the here's the bonus. The bonuses with this book is that the last third of that book is a cookbook. It's a recipe book to show you how to do this. So yeah, we, we talk about this all the time in my clinic and I'm, I'm, I, I love doing it. Wow. Thank you. Um, oh, I've lost my train of thought what I was going to ask you, but, um, uh, okay, well then we'll just move on. I'll, I'm sure it'll come back to me. Right. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I was going to ask you Yeah. people, especially cause you're in Southern California. I'm so, I mean, are people still smoking to the degree that they used to? I mean, obviously people that have smoked a long time, but are there a lot of people like new people starting to smoke? Yeah, I think it's kind of uh, what we saw was that a, there was a huge peak back in, you know, the 40s, 50s, 60s, and then a, a decline. And I think uh, a lot of that was because of the Surgeon General and and uh, removing of tobacco advertisements for magazines, etc., and taking it out of the movies. Um, and the people that are still smoking that I'm seeing after years and years of use and having COPD are because it's just so darn difficult to quit because nicotine is so addictive. It's probably one of the most addictive substances known to man. Uh, people will be surprised by that statement, but there's actually a scientific basis for the backup of that. But what you're talking about is a new wave of people that are picking up, not necessarily cigarettes, but they are finding a new and different way of getting addicted to nicotine, and that is vaping. Um, and I know that this is a, this is a, a controversy because the, 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 wedge, the wedging factor to get into people is hey, vaping is a way of satisfying the nicotine addiction without getting the toxins from cigarettes. And that's great theoretically, but the, the actual reality is, is when they do the studies and look and see who's buying these things, uh, vaping is just another way of, of basically giving, getting people addicted to nicotine. So in other words, the majority of the people who are buying the vaping are people that have never smoked cigarettes. And so there is a hu huge generation of young people that are getting hooked onto nicotine because it's being marketed to them as candy. If you look at actually in the stores, you'll see these are, they're, they're packaged like candy. It's almost, if you see them side by side, it's almost uh, identical. And so I would, uh, as part of, of, of working with my medical group, I went around to a lot of junior high and high schools in the area. This is right before the pandemic. In fact, we had to cut it short because of the pandemic because the schools were, were let out. We would take PE class and we would put all the students into the gymnasium and I'd show them about the dangers of vaping. There was even some vaping 
uh, uh, kind of like garage, uh, people in their garages making vape cartridges that were being made with vitamin E oil that was uh, later to believe to be the reason why people were getting um, what they call E-Valley, E-V-A-L-I or, or E-cigarette vaping associated lung injury. And I was seeing high school students, Chef AJ, on the ventilator, on the ventilator, young people on the ventilator. And all they did was took a vape cartridge from one of their friends and vape it. And they went into complete, it, it almost looked like COVID actually. Uh, could you imagine COVID, but then in a teenager, that's what we were seeing. So that's, that's the new thing that's happening now. I think the regulators are getting onto this and they're really trying to limit the marketing of, of, of vaping to, to teenagers. Cause I think it's going to create a, a problem. Did they get off the ventilators? Yes. Uh, so what we noticed is that steroids uh, really help. Uh, the people that get off the ventilators, though, still have lung issues that they have to sort of deal with. Uh, and, but hopefully the lungs, you know, your lungs are well overbuilt and they're very forgiving, fortunately. So um, the teenagers that I know, I mean, there have been some deaths uh, that have been recorded, but fortunately, none of the ones that I took care of died. What about like things like hookah and, um, and just like, you know, a smoking pot? Is that better? Yeah, no, unfortunately, uh, there's been plenty of studies on that now, not as many as tobacco, but plenty of studies that showed that it, it does affect the lung, it, it can cause COPD. And, and not only that, but it affects the, the, uh, the ability of your brain to be emotionally correct. So depression, um, uh, lack of, of activity, these are all all things, apathy, these are all things that can, account, can happen with just the drug from the marijuana, not even talking about the toxins from burning the leaves. Uh, but if you're vaping it, you're just vaping the THC, there, there's, there's problems with that as well. Wow, that is something. Well, I know I always ask, uh, my, my audience may not know this, but the guest always gets to decide what they want to talk about on the show and name the title of the show. And you mentioned about health in the new year, and you had a few topics you wanted to discuss in addition to diet, things like fasting, hydrotherapy, and what was the last one you mentioned? Sunlight, Sunlight which, yeah. we don't, we, which we haven't had in like a week. Yeah, so boy, there's so much to talk about. First of all, let's talk about... Um, Let's talk about meat since we're talking about that already. And I sort of alluded to this. So sialic acids, I, I really highly encourage people to look, look into sialic acids. What's going on here is this. We, science is, is starting to understand that there are antigens innate in animals, that when you ingest these animals, these antigens get absorbed in whole and get incorporated into your cells and your immune system recognizes them as foreign. And this has nothing to do with how they're fed. This has nothing to do with if they are organically sourced. This has nothing to do if they're fed with grass. This is a genetic aspect to the animals that you're eating, specifically red meat, that will cause low-grade inflammation. There was a study that was just done looking at this, and they were able to quantify the amount of sialic acid, specifically new 5GC, that was in these animals. And the more of these foods that had higher amounts of new 5GC in them, the higher amount of inflammation from the antibodies in your immune system that were being directed against these antigens. So if, if you want to reduce low-grade chronic inflammation in your body, one of the ways of doing that is to eliminate red meat out of your diet. Okay. There's, they're, they're looking at ways to get rid of this new five GC in the meat. I don't know if I really trust what kind of chemicals they may come up with to do that. But I would say if you're interested in tipping the scale in your favor, when it comes to getting sick and oxidative stress and inflammation, my recommendation would be to cut that out. And I think I'm preaching to the choir here. So um, we actually, if you want to know more about that, we actually have a video on our MedCram channel called uh, Meat and Dairy Inflammation. It talks about sialic acids. We published that about a year ago. Okay. The other thing I want to talk about that I think is really a big area that uh, people are just now starting to talk about is blowing up this idea that, you know, whatever you eat basically goes inside your body. And that's that, that's, that's how it works. And, and that actually, for the most part is true, 
But there is another aspect of this that we haven't really considered. There's another link here in the chain, and that is the gut microbiome. Now, I'm sure you've talked about this here, but there, there, are, back, there are things that you eat okay, that your body cannot digest, but you still get the benefit of them. And the reason why you get the benefit of them is because there are bacteria in your gut that can ingest those things that you're eating. And as a result, those bacteria make products that you can digest. So in other words, you need, it's kind of like a symbiotic relationship. There are certain quote, good bacteria in your gut that you need to have in order to get the benefit of the food that you eat. Let me give you an example. When, there, when you eat a lot of vegetables and fruits, there are something called polyphenols in those substances, and they're packaged in just the right amount and quantities. If you eat something like that, there are certain polyphenols and, and, and compounds that cannot be absorbed by your human body, and therefore you can't get the benefit of it. The only way you can get the benefit is if there is the right type of bacteria in your gut to break that down and then for you to absorb it. Why is that important? It's important to understand because if you have been on a diet, and let me back up here. The, what determines whether or not you have that good bacteria in your gut? What determines that is the diet that you're taking. So there are certain diets that promote those types of bacteria. So obviously, if you're eating a diet that's high in meat and, uh, and, and this sort of thing, okay, uh, you're not going to have that good bacteria. And so when you switch over and start eating a different type of diet, it's going to take time for the, the old bacteria in your system to be cleared out and the new bacteria to move in to be able to process that good food and get you the benefits of that. To give you an example of that, this is a very um, stark uh, example. It's not a patient of mine, but I, I've read about it, it was published. There is a type of, of infection that you can have in your bowel called C. diff. Clostridium difficile. You're familiar with that? Absolutely, because I used to work in nursing homes and a lot oh, of people had it. Exactly. And it's as you know, it's very contagious. You can just touch one person and spread it to another. And it's these bacteria are unique in that they create spores, which are very difficult to kill. Anyway, the way that C. tiff usually comes about is because somebody has taken an antibiotic that has wiped out the gut flora. And so then these things, because of the reduction in competition, will sprout and C. diff will happen. And C. diff can really uh, make you very, very sick. It can make your colon very thick and can give you just a, a huge amount of diarrhea. Most of the time you can fix it with a different type of antibiotic, but in some cases people get this chronically. Well, there was this one woman who had never been obese in her entire life and she had chronic C. diff and it just kept going on and on and on. And the, the science recently, this was published back in 2015, um, realized that one of the ways that you can fix this chronic C. diff from happening was to actually take the gut microbiome from somebody else. In other words, take their stool and blend it up and put it up the backside of the, of the recipients, like a stool transplant, if you will. Um, well, in this case, it was the patient's daughter that was the donor. Now, the patient's daughter was different than the mother in that the, while the mother was, had never been obese, Okay, the daughter was obese. And uh, for instance, the mother, as I remember from the report, was like in her 120, 130 pounds, somewhere around there. And, and the daughter was, was much more than that. So they went ahead and did the transplant. Over a period of time of, of a, a couple of years, the, the patient lost the C. diff, did well, but she started to gain weight. And she get, got up to about 170 pounds, 177 pounds. And this is despite a dietary plan. This is despite exercise. This is despite all of those things. Um, you know, it could have been genetics. It could have been just that she was getting older. There's a lot of explanations for it, but she had never been obese prior to the stool transplant. And it, it actually uh, uh, kind of piqued the interest of the physicians that did the transplant to the point that they actually wrote it up and um, recommended that in the future, if they were going to do a stool transplant again, to make sure they didn't get it from someone who was obese. So what does this tell us? This is one example, but what it tells me is that you may be swimming upstream if you're trying to lose weight, if, you've, if you're not eating the right types of food that are going to enhance the right gut microbiota, okay? 
Um, and so that tells me that we need to do a lot more research in that field. So that's that's another thing I wanted to talk about. Um, that is crazy. Do you think yeah. it could work the other way, Dr. Schwelt, where somebody that was uh, obese had a transplant from somebody slender? Like, is this the new frontier? In it could very well be. It, it could very well be. I mean, think about that. If you... <laughs> I don't even want to say it, but if you're nice and thin and skinny, think about how much your stool would be worth. <laughs> well, hey, maybe I'll start selling it. <laughs> we can make a market for this, yeah. Absolutely, but but I mean that because I, I I heard about that from Dr. Will Bolshewitz, who wrote Fiber Fueled. You know, in at least in my studies, they, that would happen. But it's amazing that it can happen in humans as well. Yes, exactly. I mean, this was a paper that was published in 2015. I think if you wanted to find it, I don't have the reference off the top of my head, but if you just typed, went to Google and typed in mother, daughter, C. diff, obesity, I'm sure the, the article would pop up because it's been looked at quite a bit. Yeah. So the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, hydrotherapy um, and, and sunlight. So we right now, as we talk about this, this is what, this is January 2nd. So we're in the new year. And as I speak at this moment, um, a lot of the world is experiencing uh, some sort of respiratory illness, at least in the Northern hemisphere. We've got China, which is having a COVID explosion. We've got uh, here in the United States, we've got a lot of RSV. We've got a lot of influenza. And, you know, it's, it should not be lost on people that it's exactly at the same time every year that we get these sort of illnesses. Uh, so one of the things that I really want to draw attention to is sunlight and the fact that sunlight really has a big impact on the human body. But before I get to that, I want to talk about some practical things that we can do. So one of the things that any virus, whether it's RSV or influenza or COVID-19 must do to your body, to your immune system, to be able to get a foothold into it is it needs to suppress the innate immune system's ability to kick it out right at the beginning. And the major tool that, that your body uses to kick viruses out at the very beginning of any infection is something called interferon. Interferon is well-named because it interferes with infections. And we know now very clearly that one of the proteins in SARS-CoV-2 suppresses your body's ability to make interferon. They've done studies that have shown that people who have very bad cases of COVID have low levels of interferon, where people have mild cases of COVID have very high levels of interferon. So we know that interferon is one of those very important things in fighting any type of viral infection. In fact, let me just say this, is that 20 years ago when I first started in medicine, we did not have a cure for hepatitis C, which is a viral infection. Today, we have a cure for hepatitis C. And the, the cure is giving people high dosages of interferon. That's how, that's how powerful interferon is. And it's, the, and it's the, the cornerstone of the body's ability to fight viral infections. SARS-CoV-2 knows this, and it suppresses your body's ability to do it so it can get, gather a hold. So the question is, is what can we do as human beings to increase our ability to secrete interferon at the moment that we need it, which is at the beginning of a viral infection. Well, one of the things that you can do, and it's been well shown, is that the body temperature can potentiate the white blood cells ability to make interferon. And so one of the, one of the last things I would want to do in anybody with a viral infection is to take away their ability to mount a fever. That's why I am against giving Tylenol in patients with fever, unless, unless their temperature is going above 103, 104, then, then the fever can actually be dangerous. It can cause seizures and it can cause uh, your heart rate to go a little too fast. But so long as it's less than 103, generally speaking, um, this is exactly what you want your body to do. Let me, let me explain why that is. Scientists took out of patients' bodies in a study the lymphocytes at various different temperatures and uh, stimulated them with a foreign antigen. And you know what they found? They found that in, in terms of centigrade or Celsius, that at 37.5, it was the same. At 38, it was the same. At 38.5, it was the same. Once it hit 39 degrees, which is around 102, 103, there was a tenfold increase 
in the amount of interferon that was secreted from these white blood cells. So the first thing I do is I don't treat a fever unless it's really high. The second thing I do is, and we do this all the time. If anybody in my household comes down with any kind of, Hey, I'm not feeling well. It's okay. You know what we need to do. It's the hydrotherapy. So what is hydrotherapy? It's basically anything that you can do using moist heat to increase the, the core body temperature in a way that is going to stimulate your immune system to attack and to overcome the suppression of interferon to kick out the virus. So how do I do that? What my, what my wife does this and she's amazing at it because it's, it's hard to do it on yourself. You need to have someone help you. Um, first of all, before I, I explain it, there, there's a couple of websites that I don't, uh, I'm not in control of, but they're great resources. One of them is hydro, the number four, covid.com, hydroforcovid.com. And the other one is hydrotherapyathome.com. And those have great resources to give you more details. But generally speaking, what I'm, what I'm talking here is you're taking warm towels or towels that are soaked in water, boiling water, or even put in the microwave. So they're piping hot that you can't even touch them. They're hot. And you, you put a protective uh, towel over the, the, the patient. You have them lie down and you put this hot towel over them except for their head, and you put their feet into hot water in a way, and you cover them up with heavy blankets, even a, even a, a moisture barrier, if you will. And you have them sit there for 20 minutes. What you're doing is you're heating up their body temperature and you know it's working because they start to sweat beads of sweat. They may have some moisture over their lip. What you're doing is you're heating up that body and you're telling the immune cells, hey, get to work, start stimulating that interferon, get over that. And at the end of 20 minutes, what we do is uh, we take off everything. We pour cold water over the feet. We pour cold water over the chest. We rub it. This is actually basically almost exactly what they do in Finland when they go out of the sauna and into the snow and they hit themselves with uh, all sorts of things. This is a tradition that's been gone on for a hundred years. Um, what that's doing is when you come out of the heat, the, the, the blood vessels on the surface of your body are very vasodilated. And so as a result of that, you're going to uh, exude a lot of heat. What that cold does is it vasoconstricts and it causes demargination of the white blood cells. That means the white blood cells that are stuck around the surface of the inside of the blood vessel, they get knocked off and they get put into circulation. So you're, you're activating them where they are, and then you're knocking them off and telling them to go and do what it is that they need to do. At least this is what the thought process is. You do this cold exposure for about one minute, okay? So the 20 minutes is for the heat. The one minute is for the cold. That, isn't that great? I, I'm glad it's not the other way around because I'll take heat any day. It's the cold that I don't like. And, and I'll tell you, this is something that I believe really helps in terms of COVID-19. Now, um, why do I think this? Well, there's a number of scientific studies that have shown that these changes are ha happening. And so you can connect the dots. What we don't have at this point is a randomized controlled trial that shows that hydrotherapy prevents uh, hospitalization in COVID-19. However, however, there is unpublished data Going back 100 years, speaking of Adventists, there was a, a medical director of the Adventist Sanitarium in New England, in Boston, who was treating his patients at the New England Sanitarium and also nine others in the area during the influenza pandemic, who was using this very technique and also sunshine, which we'll talk about. And whereas in the army hospitals who were giving aspirin to kill a fever, because they thought that the fever was killing the patients, so they were giving aspirin. Their infection fatality ratio was 6%, whereas the infection fatality ratio in these sanitariums where they were not treating a fever, they were actually giving a fever and they were getting patients outside and fresh air and giving them a, 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 a plant-based diet. Their infection fatality ratio was 1%. So it was one-sixth of what was going on in the army hospitals. So I, I give you that information at this point to uh, obviously to help you if you or a family member has the flu, the cold. I, I believe this works for any virus. I don't think you actually need to test. To, as soon as you start to come down with feelings of illness, and you know what those are, you know your body, get in and start doing this right away. Now, 
if you want to do a sort of a prophylactic or you want to prevent this from happening in the first place, one of the things that you could do is take hot, cold showers. So that's kind of like a tonic, uh, a way to keep your, your immune system on sentinel mode, okay? Sentry mode, if you will. So do you know five to nine minutes of hot and then one minute of cold. And I'll tell you where I live up here in the mountains, the water is cold when it's cold. So when you flip that thing over and the cold water starts to come, get ready. Uh, some people who have heart conditions or their blood pressure uh, or their heart rate might go up or they have atrial fibrillation or they pass out, you know, maybe you want to talk to your doctor before you uh, start doing this because um, get ready because you'll get a dopamine surge when you do the cold water. But I think it's necessary and it's probably very helpful. Do you have a video showing how to do the hydrotherapy? Yeah. So actually, if you if you want some of the data and uh, if you want the more practical way of doing it, go to hydrotherapyathome.com. They host on their videos of people showing you step-by-step -step how to do this. Um, and hydroforcovid.com actually has the protocols. And, and the guy, I know the guy who made the, actually, I know both of the authors of those websites. The one at Hydro for COVID published the protocols on his website directly out of what John Harvey Kellogg was doing in Battle Creek. Um, for those of you who don't know, Battle Creek Sanitarium was around about 120 years ago. It was the premier hospital for the entire world. Uh, people who were, had means, uh, presidents, uh, Henry Ford, uh, Amelia Earhart, all of these were patients that came to see John Harvey Kellogg at Battle Creek, Michigan. It's, by the way, if you don't know, it's where Kellogg's cornflakes were invented. Post cereal was invented. So this is a, a huge health craze at that time. Um, these are the protocols that were used and it's published on hydroforcovid.com. Um, is, is that a number four? or That's, that's a number four, yeah. So hydro, it's all one word, hydroforcovid.com. If you go there, you'll see exactly those protocols. Uh, Bruce Thompson is the, is the author and I've, I've discussed it with him. He even has a letter on there that you can print out and give it to your physician to let them know that this is what you're doing. And uh, this is not to be meant to be done in lieu of what your physicians might want, but in addition to what they may be doing. And then over at hydrotherapyathome.com, there I know there's a number of videos on there that show you step-by-step -step how to do it. Um, and so that's very helpful as well. Wow. That's incredible. You know, you mentioned not taking a Tylenol when you have a fever. Are you familiar with a book called The Pleasure Trap by Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Lyle? No, tell me. It's a wonderful book. I actually did the audio for it, but they talk about that not taking, you know, medication that the fever is there to serve a purpose. But sometimes when people have, this, you know, a fever, maybe not as high as 104, they have other symptoms that they want the Tylenol for, not necessarily the fever, you know, headache, body aches. So do you just say nothing, just tough it out? You know, um, I, I, I would say that um, normally I would say, yeah, tough it out. But I would also say that a number of people actually feel better and their symptoms are improved after doing the hydrotherapy. So try the hydrotherapy first. And if it still doesn't improve, you can then uh, then do some of those other things like the Tylenol if you have to. Wow, that's good to know. Where are we with COVID? Because you, you know, you're a pulmonary doctor, a critical care doctor, so you you saw it from the beginning. It, it, has it changed? Is it better? Or should we still be afraid? Where, what are your thoughts? It's um, it, it has definitely changed. Um, in, in a nutshell, this is what it basically is. Um, our bodies have two major ways of dealing with new viruses or viruses in general. Uh, one of those is the antibody response. And think of the antibody response like a glove being fit over a hand. Uh, and so it's a very specific defense against a very specific form of the virus. And, and so the, the benefit is, is that uh, if you can uh, neutralize it, then uh, this is the place that you're going to neutralize it is at the antibody level. The downside is, is that if the virus mutates, it can easily get around that antibody response. But fortunately, there's another backup, and that's the T cell response. The T cell response is the one that is responsible for preventing the worst outcomes of COVID-19, like hospitalization and death. And unfortunately, the T cell response does not depend on this hand glove approach. It's a much broader approach. And so uh, viral mutations can't get around T cell responses as easily. 
it's really quite fascinating. If you look at the immune system, the T cells actually mutate in anticipation of the virus mutating. It's, it's really quite something, right? Quite, quite fascinating. And so as a result of this, what we've seen is that uh, as the virus or the spike, let's say as the spike protein uh, gets around in the community, whether it's the spike protein coming from the vaccine or it's the spike protein coming from the virus, what has happened is, is that we've de all developed a lot of antibodies, but as the virus mutates, um, we'll see the infection rate start to bump up a little bit as there's more uh, viral mutation. So, so if you're looking at cases, if you're looking at infections, if you're looking at positive tests, um, that continues to go on and on and on um, because it's getting around that antibody response. However, in terms of the worst outcomes like hospitalization and death, the T cell response, whether it was from a natural uh, exposure to the virus or from vaccination, is doing a great job of keeping people out of the hospital. So uh, what I see today is I still see people calling me saying, hey, we came down with COVID, we came down with COVID. But as opposed to two years ago, where that was a very big concern of mine that they might end up in the hospital, I'm much less concerned today. I'm not seeing the same surge with people that we saw two years ago coming into the hospital and overwhelming us. And that's, that's fortunate. And I, think, I don't think we're going to see that again but just like we see the flu uh, every year at this time, and we had a flu pandemic, you know, over a hundred years ago, I still, I think that we're going to still see COVID every winter, but I don't think it's going to be to the same degree that we, we had uh, in the last year or two uh, with the COVID pandemic. Well, Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's very encouraging. Yeah. Do you think, you think we could get hit with something even worse? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good question with respect to the flu. Every year, the flu changes a little bit. We call that drift. But every 100 years or so, uh, there's an incorporation of a completely different antigen into the virus. And we call that antigenic, not drift, but shift. That's when you have flu pandemics. And could that happen with, with uh, SARS-CoV-2? It's, it's possible. All, so far, all we've seen is mutational drift. But is it possible that we could see a mutational shift? Absolutely. And and here's the point. Here's the point. I tell you about hydrotherapy because if that were to happen, or if there would be, God forbid, another virus completely out of, out of left field, the time it takes us to come up with a vaccine, you know, even though they came up with it very quickly this time, uh, or even a medication to test, you know, and, and that regardless of whether you think things like ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine or Paxlovid are effective or not effective or whatever your thoughts are, the point of the matter is regardless of whatever pill it is, the problem with pills is that in a surge of a virus, pills require a pharmacist, pills require a supply chain, pills require people who are well enough to deliver those things, okay? This is the reason why I, I, I don't mind those things. I think those things are important and we should do that. Hey, I mean, I'm a critical care physician that works in an ICU and give out medications all the time to save people's lives. But in those kind of situations where there's a surge, there are going to be many people that are not going to have access to that. So what do we do? It's, it behooves us to understand and be prepared to know how we can take things that are available to us without a supply chain and be able to apply that to our lives. Things like hydrotherapy, for instance. Um, and I think that's that's important. The other thing that uh, we haven't talked about, and I'll, I'll uh, talk about it when we're ready, is, is sunlight. Yeah, I love sunlight, but there isn't <laughs> <been> any. <laughs> so really interesting uh, article that was just published in a very prestigious journal called the Journal of Photobiology, Photo, uh, Photobiology. And basically what it did, what they did in the study, this was a randomized control trial, first of all. So why is that important? It's because uh, we're not talking about a observational study. We're not talking about how something was associated with something else. No, no, no. Randomized control trial data is the highest level of evidence that you can have in a scientific study. It's where you randomize people to placebo or intervention and you give them the intervention and then you see what happens. And in this intervention, what they did was they, they put a jacket, a, a jacket that they made in this study. And on the inside of the jacket were a whole array of 300 different LED lights. 
Now these LED lights were very special LED lights because these LED lights transmitted lights in the near infrared spectrum, specifically at 940 nanometers. This is not light that you can see. This is light that can penetrate into your skin fairly deeply. Some studies say up to about eight centimeters, depending on the, uh, depending on the uh, intensity. And what they found is that when they did this for just 15 minutes a day, for seven days, that there was a tremendous impact in those patients in terms of COVID. So all of these patients had COVID. All of these patients were hospitalized. There was an equal distribution of male versus female. And what they found, what, how, how did they get better? Specifically, their oxygenation levels improved better than the controls. And by the way, the control was they put the jacket on the control patients. They just didn't switch the light on. Okay. So they knew, I mean, no, the patients didn't know if they were getting treatment or not, because first of all, you can't see the light from the LED. And second of all, everybody had the jacket on. So pretty good blinding. Okay. What they found was that they had better oxygenation. They had a better ability to take a breath in and out by the end of the study. And they had improvements in their white blood cell counts above and beyond the control. And they had an improvement in their lymphocytes, which are really important to fighting the virus uh, better than control. But here's the key. Here's the, here's the key that uh, really blew my mind. They, a full four days, a full four days better in terms of getting out of the hospital. Okay, so just let me give you an idea that of, of why four days is so important. First of all, when patients come into the hospital and they stay there uh, and they're taking up a bed for four more days, that's, that's a, a, a bed for four more days that you can get another person in, okay? But just to give you in terms of the magnitude of the effect of this, when we give Tamiflu for the influenza virus, do you know what the, the endpoint was there for that study? Uh -uh. One day. Wow. So we, we give Tamiflu in the flu, not because it improves mortality. It just reduces symptoms by one day. Okay. This jacket got the patients out of the hospital four days sooner than those without uh, the, the jacket being turned on. This, why, no, so what, the question is, is, why would near infrared radiation work in a patient who has COVID-19? Well, near infrared radiation based on recent scientific discovery, may enhance the production of melatonin in the mitochondria in the cells that coat the pulmonary arteries or the pulmonary vessels in the lungs. Why is that important? Because melatonin stabilizes the oxidative stress that COVID-19 places on that cell, okay? And why is that important? Because if these endothelial cells are oxidized to the point that they are so uh, destroyed, what happens is they release this thing called von Willebrand's factor into the bloodstream. Von Willebrand's factor is a pro-coagulant. My dog actually had von Willebrand's disease. They didn't know it. When he was having an operation. He almost died because he had that rare disease for a dog. So, so the problem in your, in your dog is that he doesn't have enough von Willebrand's factor. So he has the opposite problem in that he bleeds too much. Right. These people have, uh, the, the people that have a dif dysfunction in this case, have too much of it released into the blood. And as a result, th they don't bleed, but they actually clot. And so what happens is that these micro white clots, and, and, and we knew this very early on, the New England Journal of Medicine published a report showing that, that people with COVID-19 on autopsies had multiple, multiple blood clots, but they weren't the typical blood clots that we see normally. They were what we call white blood clots, white meaning that they were full of platelets. And what's activated the platelets is the von Willebrand's factor. So, uh, and by the way, the other thing that's really interesting about this is that it ties in is that there was a lot of debate at the beginning about whether or not type A, type B, type AB, or type O blood was protective against COVID-19. So what's interesting is that some studies seem to indicate that type O blood uh, was actually slightly protective. Well, what we know from, from scientific reports is that people with type O blood typically have lower levels of von Willebrand's factor. So could that have been tied in? So here's the point is that if you are exposing yourself to near infrared radiation, 
and stabilizing your endothelial cells in your lungs, because that's where they applied it, the chances of you having more blood clots goes down and oxygen levels go up. And that's exactly what they saw in this randomized controlled trial data, which seems to validate the hypothesis that near infrared radiation is stimulating enough melatonin to make a difference. Now, we don't know if that's actually happening, but what we do know is that near infrared radiation makes a difference. So here's what I would say. Here's what I would say. Rather than going online onto Amazon and trying to find a near infrared light, go outside where the largest, biggest LED bulb in the solar system is giving you near infrared light. And by the way, that near infrared light penetrates through the clouds. It penetrates through your clothes. So I don't wanna be in conflict with your dermatologist. If you have to wear a, a broad rim hat to get rid of the ultraviolet radiation, more power to you. If you wanna wear clothes to cover up your skin, more power to you. The, the good news is, is that the near infrared radiation that you need in your body, you can only get it outside. So cover up, put on sunscreen if you want. It doesn't matter. Near infrared radiation will get to you so long as you are outside. It cannot get to you when you're inside your house. And there's three reasons why. Well, actually, there's two, there's two main reasons why. Number one is that the light bulbs that we use in our house today are made out of LED bulbs. Different LED bulbs than in the jacket they use in the study. These are LED bulbs that are specifically designed to give only visual spectrum light nothing in the infrared spectrum, okay? So uh, you're not gonna get any near infrared anymore from your lights. You used to with the incandescent bulbs, but not anymore. Number two, second reason, is that the windows that we are given now in the state of California and many, many states are, and around the world, these windows are specifically designed to block near infrared radiation. And they do it for a good reason. It's because it's the near infrared radiation that comes through the window that heats up the home and causes you to have higher air conditioning bills. So we are in energy conservation mode. And so if you feel like you need in near infrared radiation, let me tell you, I think this study uh, not only tells me that, but it sort of tells me that the, the theory on this is valid. The only way this is going to happen is to go outside. Don't go, don't go looking for a near infrared lamp. Don't go buy a near infrared sauna. You can do that if you want to do that. Um, here are the two ways of doing it naturally. When the sun is up, get outside. When the sun is down, another way of potentially doing it, although it's harder to do now here in the state of California because they've kind of banned it. But if you have a fireplace, the fire emits near infrared radiation in all sorts of spectrum. If you can sit close to that without getting burned or hurting yourself, you can also get near infrared radiation that way. So um, that's what I do. I live up, you know, about 4,700 feet. They haven't banned fireplaces up here above 3,000 feet. And it's really cold, as I said, where I live, probably cold up there in San Francisco uh, area. But if, you, if you're living in a place that, that you can have a, a fire, um, that might be also a way of getting near infrared radiation as well. So, but th here are the two things. So if you break it down, how can you, how can you prevent yourself from getting ill and how can you treat yourself when you do get ill and i would say if you want to do it without depending on a supply chain great if we have a supply chain great take take advantage of the supply chain but there may become a day where you don't have a supply chain and what do you do you've got to understand it and know how to do it now know this information now so when the time comes you're prepared for that i would say consider highly sunlight and consider highly hydrotherapy Wow. Well, have you ever thought about writing a book? <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, every time I sit down to write a book and I research it, I find something more that's interesting. And then I get onto that. So I, I do have to sit down and write a book. Probably it will be a book about my experiences here in the pandemic. And you'll yeah. be in the book. <laughs> oh, cool. I love it. Hey, you know, there are, you know, people keep saying, well, eventually everybody's going to get COVID. And there are some people I know, they're, they're very healthy plant-based eaters now, but they are in their 70s and 80s, and they had comorbidities. They reversed them through a plant-based diet, and because they're older, they had the attitude, look, I'm going to live my life, and it's not that they didn't obey the law, you know, in other words, like they masked when they had to and things like that, but for the most part, they never turned down a social engagement. They are the most social 
two couples I've known, cruises, everything, and they've never gotten it. And then I, you know, of course they're vaccinated and boosted and stuff like that. But then I know other people that have avoided everything and still got it. Is it the luck of the draw? Because I read somewhere, and I don't know if this is true, that there will be a certain percentage of people that will not get it even when exposed, that there's some kind of genetic link to that. Is yeah. that true? Yeah, we actually covered that in a video, uh, why some people may never get um, uh, COVID-19. And it, and it may have to do with um, your genetics. So on your body are some marker on each one of your cells, and you inherit this from your mother and your father, are something called HLA uh, genes or um, HLA proteins. And these are very unique proteins. Um, and it's, in some cases, it can be a problem because if they try to find an organ transplant for you, they got to get it matched or HLA matched. So yeah, there, there are people uh, with completely different genetics. So what they did in the study was they looked at all of the people that had registered. You know, I've, I've done this too. Maybe you have too. When you go give blood, they say, hey, would you like us to put your blood into an account so that one day, if there's somebody that matches you perfectly that needs, you know, a bone marrow transplant, we can ask you to donate bone marrow, which you can do that, you know, that doesn't kill you. You can do that. It's not like they're giving an organ. Isn't it um, very painful though? I heard It is painful. It is painful. Yeah. It's probably more painful for the donor than it is for the recipient actually. Right. Yeah. Uh, so you have to think, they, they tell you that you have to think about it. But anyway, I, I put it into the thing. I, I think I've gotten contacted once saying that there was, that there may be a match, but then they never uh, followed up. So I, I probably fell through, but nevertheless, there's a huge bank out there with a bunch of people's HLAs. And then what they did was they looked and asked, they sent them a questionnaire. And they asked them, have you ever had COVID? What were the symptoms? Blah, blah, blah. They said a bunch of stuff. And they just put it through the, the computer meat grinder and tried to sort it to see. And what they found was that there was a certain HLA, I think it was uh, HLA B uh, 15 point something or other. It's in my video. I can't remember the actual number, but they found that these, the people that had this HLA were, you know, if they had one copy of the gene from, let's say they got it from their mother they were like three to four times less likely to get COVID. And if they had both of these genes from the mother and the father, they were up to like 10 or even more times less likely to get COVID-19. So how is, how is this working? Uh, what happens when an antigen comes into your body, the virus antigen comes into your body, it gets put onto this HLA molecule. Okay, so the HLA molecule that's sitting on your T cells or your, or your um, pr presentation cells, the, the cells that present this thing, uh, the, the cells that uh, are infected. Um, when the cell gets infected, it takes the virus and it chops it up into little pieces and it takes these little pieces and it puts it on the surface of the cell and it says, hey, look, I'm infected, come and destroy me. Okay, it sounds like kind of like a suicide thing, but that's what your body has to do to preserve the whole situation. The cell has to declare that it's infected so that the immune system can come and destroy the cell. So that protein that it gets put on is this HLA gene product. So not only is it telling the immune system that you're a unique individual, but it's also the, the actual way that the cell is telling the immune system to come and kill me. Now, it seems as though that different variations in this protein can elicit better responses from the immune system. So that if you have this particular uh, kind of, of protein, the immune system is gonna recognize it better and it's going to kill more efficiently. And it may be that people who have that gene, the virus is killed so quickly that they never actually get the symptoms. And so remember when we say, that they never got COVID, that's different than saying that they never got infected. COVID specifically means symptoms. So if somebody is infected with the virus, but they never have symptoms, they never had COVID. That Strictly is speaking. fascinating. Yeah. That is really, that is really, real. is there a way to test if you're one of these lucky people genetically? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you just test. Uh, and again, I, I've got it. If you go back to my, if you go onto our MedCram uh, channel and you look at why some people may never get COVID. Okay. Not, not why some people may not get infected, but why some people may never get COVID, which is the symptoms. I, I spell it all, all in there. And I, and I specifically list the specific HLA gene product. So you can actually pay out of 
pocket and, and go to Quest or to LabCorp and ask for this gene. And they will tell you what your HLA uh, gene products are. And, and there's, a, there's, there's an HLA-A, there's an HLA-B, there's an HLA-C, and there's two versions of it because you actually have two parents. And they'll tell you what your HLA-B is, and then you'll see it there. And if it's there, then it's there. If it's not, then you know you're, you've just been lucky. <laughs> that is really fascinating. Once somebody has COVID and has the symptoms, how long do they have immunity and how long does it last for? So they looked at this pretty early on. 30, about, it was kind of actually kind of interesting, about 20 to 30% of people that got infected with COVID, this is before vaccination, um, did not have antibodies. Okay, so we didn't measure T cells, but you have to realize that um, when somebody becomes infected with SARS-CoV-2, it, there's no standardization. Some people might get maybe 500 viral particles, which is not enough to cause an infection. Some people may get a thousand particles, which is just enough to get infected. Some people may have 10,000 particles and, and that's already the virus has sort of uh, jumped ahead there. And you can imagine that the immune system's response to the number of particles is going to be different. And so you can see that some people may not mount an antibody response and some people might mount an antibody response. And what they found was about maybe 20 to 30%, or let's say it's 20% uh, of people who become infected with the virus may not mount antibodies. So the question is, is are they immune or are they not immune? They may have tested positive, but they don't have antibodies. And so, uh, but the normal situation is, is that yes, if you become infected with the virus, you're going to have antibodies. Now there's been some confusion to think that, well, which is better, natural immunity versus, uh, versus uh, vaccine immunity. And uh, some people believe that uh, natural immunity in every case is always better than vaccine immunity. That's actually not the case. Um, we can give you a couple of examples. One, the biggest, the biz the biggest example is with uh, HPV, infection of the cervix. So uh, if, if a, a man or a woman becomes infected with HPV in, in the genital area, specifically with women, they can actually get chronic infections of HPV and uh, that can turn into cervical cancer, which is not good. There was a recent study that was done in Sweden where the HPV vaccine, which is, you know, it's not without pain, uh, can actually completely eliminate in, in recipients the chances of, of uh, by 99%, the chances of getting uh, 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 cervical cancer. And why is that? Because the HPV vaccine is much better at invoking an immune response in the human being than a natural infection, which can cause chronic infection. Now that's, that's HPV, but are there other infections where natural immunity is better than the vaccine? Of course. And so it's not, it's not always the case that it's dependent. So in terms of COVID, uh, in terms of hospitalization, I would say that uh, vaccine immunity is just as good as, uh, as what people call natural immunity or infection immunity based on a number of studies. One, the biggest one was that the Mayo Clinic early on, it showed that people who had the infection uh, in a natural way had very good immunity at keeping themselves out of the hospital. Uh, the issue has always been though, is uh, not just immunity, but the complications of getting COVID-19. So there was just a recent study that was published that looked at what SARS-CoV-2 virus does to monocytes. And uh, as we talked about, the virus suppresses the immune response, the innate immune response, the interferon response. And it seemed to turn on these monocytes to being pro-coagulants or causing blood clots. Uh, and this was through a protein that had nothing to do with spike protein. So this was a non-spike protein SARS-CoV-2 virus protein that was causing hypercoagulable uh, situation. So um, it's complicated. It's not easy to, to talk and uh, to, to sort of have sound bites, sound bites about the virus, just like anything in medicine, it's complicated. Wow. Thank you. Uh, somebody's asking about light boxes, red light therapy. Arlene wants to know, she says they're expensive. Uh, they have visible red light and NIR. Are those valuable? And Jerry wants to know how much sunlight do we need every day? Excellent question. So remember in this study that it was 940 nanometers of lights. Um, a lot of those things that you buy on Amazon are not at 940. So I don't know if it's going to work the same. What I can tell you is that the sun 
is giving you 940 nanometers uh, wavelength of light plus a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, and so my advice would be is that don't, don't spend your money on buying light boxes and things on Amazon. Uh, get outside into the sunlight and, and you can be guaranteed that you're going to be getting the right wavelength because the sun has every wavelength and it's also uh, pretty powerful. Now, in terms of how long you should be outside, well, the jacket was only used for 15 minutes a day. You know, I don't know. They didn't they didn't try it twice a day or or for 20 minutes or 30 minutes. We just know that 15 minutes twice a day works. And so I would or sorry, 15 minutes once a day works, according to the study. So I would say getting outside for 15 minutes a day would be a great place to start. If you can get more than that, that's great. Fantastic. You know, I have some questions, actually that were sent in in advance. And the first one is from Susan. And she says, do you recommend taking Paxlovid for COVID? I've managed to avoid catching COVID and gotten all my available vaccines, but I'm thinking about what to do if I do catch it. A fa apparently the fact that I'm on blood thinners precludes taking it if I need it. Yeah, so Paxlovid is a medication that um, prevents the virus from replicating. You need to get to it within about five days. Otherwise it uh, the, sort of the cat's out of the box. There are some drug interactions because one of the medications that's that's in there with Paxlovid really slows down your metabolism of, of other medications. So if you're on those other medications, you you really should stop those medications or not take Paxlovid. So those are the those are the things that are are a problem. One of the things obviously that you're taking is a blood thinner, and that blood thinner that you're taking is metabolized by your body in the same system that metabolizes the product of Paxlovid. And so um, you don't want to cross-react that because it can cause a problem by elevating the levels of the anticoagulant. So who should take Paxlovid? So when they did the tests, they actually looked at people who were not vaccinated. Okay, so just so you know, when we do studies, we look at the populations very carefully that these are done in, and we try to say, these are the populations that this is really indicated for. So we don't have a lot of data on people who are vaccinated and taking Paxlovid. We don't know what that efficacy is based on randomized control trial data. We have some data on post-production, post-marketing that seems to indicate that there is some benefit, um, but we don't know for sure. So who would I recommend Paxlovid for? People without contraindications, people who are high risk for getting hospitalized. So they're immunocompromised. They, they may not have been able to get the benefit of the vaccine because believe it or not, the vaccine doesn't work unless you have a good immune system. The vaccine requires a good immune system to work. And so if you have a, a poor immune system or you're immunocompromised and you've been vaccinated, in my mind, I'm still thinking that you're not as protected as you should be. And so Paxlovid may be a good way of making sure that you don't end up in the hospital um, uh, if you have SARS-CoV-2. So that, those are the kind of people that I would recommend. And you've got to look very carefully at the medicine list that you're on to make sure that it does not interact with Paxlovid. So as you can see here, there's no one silver bullet. What we try to do in medicine is we have a lot of tools that we can use because there's a lot of different types of people in the world. And so somebody might say, you know, my immune system's great. I don't need the vaccine. I don't need Paxlovid. Well, that's great for you, but I, I've got Mrs. Jones here who's got sarcoid and she's got this situation and that situation. And, you know, and, and it's good that we have these things for her because I don't want her getting into the hospital and because she doesn't have a good immune system for no fault of her own. Thanks. Uh, John wants to know, does he get the full UVA protection or like, does he get enough sun if he goes out before 10 AM? Oh yeah. So that's a good point. So ultraviolet uh, light can only penetrate through the atmosphere when the sun is pretty high in the sky, between 10 and two. I think that's what he's referencing there. Near infrared radiation is not like that. Near infrared radiation can penetrate through the atmosphere even when the sun is very low in the sky. So if you wanna get outside before 10 in the morning or after two o'clock in the afternoon, you're, you're gonna be avoiding the maximum time of ultraviolet radiation uh, exposure, but you're gonna be getting plenty of infrared exposure during that time. So no problems at all. Great. And Shauna wants to know, do you still get the health benefits if you're in the shade under an umbrella? Yes, you do. So um, near infrared radiation tends to bounce off things. Actually, if you want the, the most near infrared radiation, even better than standing in the sun, is being uh, around a lot of green. So green leaves, green plants, 
Uh, the green in those leaves tends to reflect highly near infrared radiation. Have you ever noticed that on a hot day, as soon as you go under a large tree, it gets very cool under there? That's because yeah. those leaves are reflecting off near infrared. Do, do me a favor when you get done here, go on to Google and type in near infrared photography and look at what plants and green trees look like in near infrared photography. The leaves look like they are light bulbs. They are glowing. And so if you are, if you want to be out there outside and under a tree, you can do that. Or if you're outside uh, under a shade and, and, the, the, and you can see green leaves, that means you're getting plenty, plenty, plenty of near infrared radiation. And you can wear full clothing. You can wear a broad rimmed hat. You can put sunscreen on. You're still getting near infrared radiation. That's good to know. Alisa said, is the winter sunlight far north still strong enough for us to get the sunlight we need? Absolutely. So again, it's, uh, even though it's not enough for ultraviolet because the sun is pretty low in the sky, it's still enough to give you near infrared. Now you might need to be out there a little bit longer and it might not feel like you're getting it, but you're getting near infrared. This, I think this is what's happening is people are in the high North and they're getting just enough to get by in the summertime. And as soon as that sun goes down in the wintertime and stays down, that's enough to put them in. And that's why we see influenza spikes in the wintertime. That's why we see COVID spikes. If you get out there for longer, um, it's, it's going to be beneficial. Obviously, it's easier in the summertime, but we should make a special effort in the wintertime. And don't forget, you can also get near infrared radiation from fireplaces as well. So if that's something that you have in your life, uh, camp out there by the fireplace. Just don't burn yourself. <laughs> Here's a question, and then I, I want to respect your time, and then we'll say goodbye to you because I know you have a busy working schedule. But this was sent in to us in advance by Jean. This is just a regular lung doctor question. And she wants to know if you have any suggestions to mitigate reduced lung function due to kyphosis and scoliosis from vertebral compressions, compression fractures and exposure to secondhand smoke for five weeks for 30 years in an 80 year old senior? Do you have any diet or <laughs> exercise suggestions? Well, that, I can't get more specific than that. So, so what she's describing here is if you can imagine your lungs are sitting in your chest and your spine is pretty straight up, uh, maybe a little bit curved like this. What's happened is the spine, because the, the little uh, uh, vertebral bones in there have become compressed, it's now instead of being nice and straight, it's kind of like this. And so as a result of this, because it's compressed, the lungs are not expanding as much. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do from a lung standpoint. This is really the cage that has to be improved. Sometimes orthopedic surgeons can go through and, and put rods in there to, to straighten it out. Um, but from a, a lung standpoint, we're really at the mercy of the bones surrounding the lung. Wow. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your wonderful channel and your, all the information and for taking the time to do this. I know how busy you are and I really appreciate it, Dr. Schwelt. Thank you, Chef AJ. It was always a pleasure. Oh, I'd love to have you on as often as you're available. Thank you. And happy new year to you and your family. And tell your, I'd like to have your parents on. I mean, it's amazing. They're, they're doing it before you. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, so. I know, you're doing great. Thanks, Dr. Schwartz. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks yeah. all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time for Straight Talk with Dr. Doug Lyle.